Hello, Knitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co host, Knit Callis. And, uh, yeah, this series is still a thing. I know a lot of you probably think that I had given up on it because the last time I made an episode was six months ago, but as I've said many times, I'm going to finish this series if it kills me. I just think that if finishing it was the only thing that I did, that it might actually kill me, so I like to space it out here and there. And that's unfortunate, because I really do think that I'd be much better off if top model videos were the only thing that I made. Based on stats and audience feedback, they are by far the most popular thing that I do. And if there's one thing I've learned from watching Mr. Beast videos for a month, it's that the algorithm really likes it when you give the people the same thing that they already like over and over and over and over and over again. I sometimes think about how things would have been different for me if I, and by extension my channel, had been more focused. And every video I made in the past year and a half had been a continuation of this one series that I know does well for me. And like, maybe it's just wishful thinking, but I really do think that I'd be a lot further along if that had been the case. And truth told, I do sometimes wish that that had been the case. I'm at a point where I need to get to a more sustainable place with this YouTube stuff in order to justify continuing on with it for that much longer. And so on some level, I do kind of regret not just focusing on the one thing that I knew would be more likely to lead me to success. And part of me thinks that maybe I still should. I'd be lying if I said I didn't constantly contemplate overhauling my channel and leaning into being the top model guy that it feels like the universe is telling me to be, even if that means that I don't get to make everything that I'd want to make and that I wouldn't get to do things exactly the way that I want to do them. That said though, I, I don't wanna. So now, here we are, chugging along at my own self-sabotaging pace, and while I'm sorry that it's taken me this long to make this next installment, I will say that I think that the wait may very well have been worth it, because today we'll be discussing one of the weirdest, craziest, most problematic episodes of Top Model ever made. This is Cycle 6, Episode 10, The Girl Who Is Rushed to the Emergency Room, and if that title concerns you, well, good, it should. That shows that you've been paying attention. We're a little more than halfway through the season at this point, and tensions seem to be running high in the top model house, as evidenced by this opening breakfast between Joni and Jade. Despite every, everything, you know, <clears throat> I wish you well and I wish myself well. Yeah, sure. I could see you being very demanding. Like, that's, I can see you being a little two-faced. I love Jade. Watching that clip, I'm reminded of what evil geniuses the editors of this show are. Like, clearly, what I just showed you is the end of a much longer conversation that the two of them were having, but the way it's presented, it makes it seem as though the two of them were just sitting in silence and then Jade decided to insult Joni out of nowhere. And I know I talk a lot of shit about the deceptive choices that the producers make on here, but in this case I'm actually okay with it, because even if what they're showing us isn't a fully accurate portrayal of the situation, I do think that it's an accurate portrayal of Jade. Like, the general rule of thumb for writing narrative nonfiction is that you don't need to have every detail of a story 100% accurate, so long as what you're saying is true to the story as a whole. And I feel like this breakfast is a really good example of that, because while I don't think that Jade is currently just insulting Joni out of the blue for no reason, I absolutely believe that Jade would 
insult Joni out of the blue for no reason? Because regardless of whatever context we might be missing from this conversation, one thing that I feel very confident in is that Jade's goal here was definitely to offend Joni. She says that she's both demanding and two-faced, which are two very different things to be. Demanding implies that you're overly upfront, whereas two-faced implies that you're sneaky. So I'm almost tempted to say that as far as criticisms go, they're the opposite of one another, but that said, I don't even think that they're related enough to one another to be opposites. So. The fact that she tells Joni that she's both in the span of a single breath makes me think that Jade is kind of just saying the first negatives that pop into her head, and she doesn't really care about the meanings of the words that she uses so long as they accomplish the goal of making Joni feel bad in some way. I feel like she's basically just trying to get inside of Joni's head here, which would make sense because that's something that Jade has already done a lot over the course of the season. I mean, hell, based solely on Joni's face here, Jade has already done it a lot to Joni specifically. I just don't feel like Jade's a good person on the inside, and I think that America's Next Top Model needs to be someone that others can talk to, look up to. Now, I'm no acting teacher, but if I were, I feel like I could teach an entire semester on Joni's expression alone, because what she does here is an absolute masterclass in expressing visual information. In the span of a couple of seconds, she manages to tell the audience that she's over the competition, she hates Jade with a fiery passion, and she's currently dead inside, all without ever saying a single word. And to Jade's credit, she does seem to pick up on the fact that Joni is not happy here, because, well, how could you not? So she does her best to pull it back a little bit, but... Because she's Jade, she pulls it back in a very Jade way. But not in a two-faced in, in such a negative form, mm -hmm. but just like, oh, you do definitely have a mother instinct. And like again, she's trying to backpedal from calling Joni two-faced and demanding. So to tell her that she's maternal feels like a weird choice because that word is not related to what she's already said in literally any way. I truly do feel like her thought process here was that she saw Joni got mad, so she just searched her brain for the first positive word she could think of and said that because I'm starting to suspect that the words Jade uses don't really matter so long as the vibe is right. Which is very weird because you'd think that Jade would care a lot about words because she is after all a poet. Heaven and hell, earth, power, wind, force. Make me listen, and my strength will be my source. Still, for as comfortable as that breakfast was, I actually do think that this is what it looks like when Jade is trying to be civil, because based on her talking head that they show us in the scene, she's saving all of the really vicious stuff for behind Joni's back. Joni just doesn't strike me as a model, because I feel like if she was put in a position to go to castings in New York, I think they would laugh at her. She doesn't scream model to me at all. I love Jade. After that lovely breakfast, the girls receive a Tyra mail. Tyra mail! You will find yourself in a strange position tomorrow, Tyra. Maybe we're gonna be in a circus. <laughs> Maybe. And like normally I don't agree with Sarah, but that look of apprehension in her eyes feels like a very appropriate response to what Feranda just read because that could honestly mean anything. Based on what we've seen thus far in the competition, find yourself in a strange position could be hinting at anything from them doing yoga to them learning how to politely respond to being sexually harassed by someone who may be looking to hire them. So I feel like they're right to be on edge. The girls drive to their lesson and the camera turns its focus towards Feranda. We have done so much, but it's constant. We've been doing stuff, doing it, doing it, doing it. Go to sleep at two, wake up at six. For Rondo, I think she's putting too much thought into it and she's kind of like choking. You know, I think she just needs to kind of like calm down, chill out, you know, focus, regroup. Rhonda goes home this week and so they're clearly foreshadowing that her time has come because like the pressure of the competition has gotten to her, but like, has it though? Or 
Is she just being a human being reacting appropriately to the subpar working condition she's found herself in? If what she's saying is to be believed, the girls are operating on four hours of sleep a night, which, I don't know, maybe I'm just old fashioned, but I feel like that super shouldn't be legal. From where I'm standing, the fact that she's managed to stay conscious feels like a sign of great perseverance, but the show seems to view the fact that she's dared to complain about something worth complaining about as tantamount to her turning in her resignation letter. If this episode has a thesis, it's that participating in any amount of self-care is the most shameful thing that a person can do, and the ultimate virtue in life is to risk one's own life for the sake of their career. You'll see. The girls arrive at their lesson, and thankfully, despite the threatening Tyra mail, nothing they'll be learning today will be too difficult or emotionally taxing. I mean, maybe it will be for people who are operating on four hours of sleep, but on paper it's fairly tame. Today the girls will be learning about Thai classical dance. F for reasons. I'm going to be teaching you Thai classical dance as models. You have to express with the face and the body. Maybe the movements of Thai classical dance will enhance your ability as models. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but it really feels like that lady is jumping through hoops to try and justify why she's on the show. Like obviously movement is very important to modeling, but I really don't think that an hour long lesson where the girls learn to do this is gonna help them book a campaign anytime soon. And again, I may be very wrong, but the hunch I get is that nobody working on the show knew enough about Thailand to sustain a four episode run there. This lesson to me kind of feels like the end result of someone on set being like, someone find out what that thing with the pointy hats is called and make them do that. That, that feels pretty Thai. Still, well thought out or not, it works because the Thai dance sections are some of the most entertaining parts of the episode. There are very few things this show does that I love more than when they try to cram hundreds of years worth of culture into a short lesson and then judge the contestants on their ability to be perfect at it. And of all of the ways that Top Model has bastardized other cultures over the years, this one might very well be my favorite because this particular piece of culture is very complicated and subtle, which obviously means that there are a lot of big, culturally insensitive laughs in our future. In the lesson, the girls are inundated with a lot of very specific things that they need to remember, and there is no world in which they're able to keep track of it all, much less the world that they currently exist in, where, lest you forget, they have only gotten four hours of sleep. Flowers can be the bird, can be me, I am. The moves were very intricate and they're telling a story, so there's a lot of tricky things involved with Thai dancing. Love and shyness. It's very important, the image of the hands is good looking in the camera. And again, I still don't entirely get how what they're learning here is supposed to help them become a better model because, well, it really feels like it only applies to Thai dance. Then again, I'm obviously not a model, so who am I to say? Jade certainly seems to be getting a lot out of it, so. The hands never go higher than the eyes. For the men could go to eyebrow and higher for being arrogant. Thank you, Pachavati, for letting me know, because that's not what I am, man. I, have, I don't have an ounce of arrogance in my body. As their lesson winds down, we learn that Danielle is not feeling well, a fact that the show tells us about in the most respectful and subtle way that it can manage, by having everything go double like it's a cartoon. The further along we go and, you know, learning the dance, everything becomes really faint to me. It's like almost like an outer body experience. And I'm going to be talking about Danielle's illness a lot today because, well, it's most of the episode. But I do want to say up front that I really don't enjoy watching what happens in this storyline. She is very clearly suffering here. And because it's Danielle, she's probably suffering a lot more than she lets on. 
Danielle has been feeling woozy all day. She's such a strong person and to really, really see her not look well is just a sign to me that something's really wrong. Still, it is Danielle, so she toughs it out for as long as she can. And then probably a little bit longer after that. After the lesson, the girls convene on a park bench backstage where Joni and Jade continue the fight they were having at breakfast. You know, I do respect each and every one of you for what you believe in. Okay, Jade? What, man? What? Okay, no, seriously. Like, I do. And I... I, I don't know, man. I don't know what you think of me. You're always defensive and... And what? Yeah, and I don't... To who? I don't, to everybody. <laughs> no, that's lies. People are perceiving me this way. And no, all, I'm not. No, lies. I'm not. No, I'm not. Lies. Listen to yourself. Okay, I'm sorry, but there is nothing funnier to me than someone responding to being told that they're defensive by getting defensive. Like, she doesn't even let Joni finish her sentence, which... I'm sorry, Jade, you know I would die and or kill for you, but you're really not helping your case there. Also, if my acting class makes it to a second semester, I would have them study Feranda's face in this scene, because this right here is some world-class visual storytelling. While Joni and Jade are at one another's throats, Danielle quietly sneaks away from the conversation, presumably so she can go find a corner that she can die in without inconveniencing anybody by complaining. Where's Danielle? She okay? I don't know where she is. I feel bad for the girl. <laughs> Poop titties vagina butt. I don't know. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure how to maintain the humorous tone I'm going for with this video after showing you such an unpleasant clip. So I just started saying a bunch of random dirty words. Hopefully it worked. But yeah, Danielle is rushed to the hospital where she's scared for her life and doesn't understand a single word anyone is saying. And I can tell you from personal experience that while being sick is terrible, being sick in another country is way worse. When I was in college, I studied abroad in Buenos Aires for a semester, and while I was there, I came down with a really bad gastrointestinal thing that hurt like hell and required medical attention. I'm still not entirely sure what it was because my Spanish isn't great but my suspicion is that it was a very mild case of appendicitis that went away on its own. Uh, like, I'm not entirely sure if that's something that's actually possible, but I ended up having appendicitis later in the year when I came home to the States, and it felt very similar. So I kind of think that this was the very early rumblings of that. Whatever it was, though, it felt like what I imagine getting stabbed in the large intestine must feel like, and I could barely stay upright from all the pain. It was bad all day, but it really hit me when I was in the middle of taking a test. And like, it was a makeup test that I really needed to do well on in order to pass the class I was in. So I just remember putting every ounce of strength I had into finishing the essay portion. And then once I was done, I just kind of quietly slunk out of my desk so I could curl up on the floor because the cold of the tile made the pain slightly more tolerable. When my teacher noticed me huddled in the fetal position, he called the administrative office who called a doctor who came to the school very quickly to check on me because every healthcare system in the world is better than America's. And like I said, my Spanish wasn't great. Like I think I was technically fluent at that point, but not the kind of fluent that you trust in an emergency situation. So when the doctor came, they had a translator who volunteered at the school sit in on my checkup with me, which was fun. I think I was probably 20 at the time, and she couldn't have been older than 22, so to have her in there with me was uncomfortable, especially because, like I said, the pain seemed to be coming from my GI area, so the symptoms I was having were very intimate in nature. The doctor would say something that I was too tired to even try and understand, and then the translator would look at me and be like, how have your bowel movements been recently? And then I just have to describe my bowel movements to this poor girl who for sure wasn't being paid enough for that shit and wait while she figured out how to translate my description into Spanish 
and relay the information to the doctor. I honestly don't think that any one of the three of us made eye contact during the entire appointment. When the doctor had gotten enough information out of me, he sent the translator out of the room, but not before having her tell me to do one last thing. To, to pull my pants down. And like, keep in mind that at this point, I'm literally in an empty classroom in the middle of my study abroad center. So in hindsight, it is very weird that I ended up bare ass in there, but at the time I was too focused on the fact that I was pretty sure I was dying in order to care. So I did as I was told. I pulled my pants down and the doctor pulled out a syringe and injected it into my butt five feet away from the desk I sat in to take Spanish class. And like, to this day, I have no clue what was in that needle, but it made me feel better almost instantly. And uh, yeah, that's my story. And I don't really know why I told it to you other than I'm trying to stall so I don't have to talk about the show because Danielle's storyline makes me very uncomfortable and I want to avoid it for as long as I can. And so that's what I'm going to do by skipping ahead to this week's challenge in which the girls have to put what they've learned to the test by going on stage and performing Thai classical dance in front of a crowd. And like, obviously, I'm no expert in Thai classical dance, but as best as I can tell, they all do fine. I'm sure that someone who knows what they're looking at would probably be horrified that these people were allowed to perform Thai dance for an audience of millions of people, but to my untrained eye, it seems like they're doing what the lady told them to do, and it all looks very pretty. The only person who falls short here is Feranda, although I hesitate to say that she failed at doing a Thai classical dance because I don't think that she ever actually even attempted to do a Thai classical dance. At this challenge, once again, my nerves have taken over and the things that I know I should be doing kind of go out of the window and I just go off on this tangent of Whatever. Okay, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like she was like two seconds away from just straight up doing the cabbage patch just now. Eventually, Ferranda's movements stray so far away from Thai classical dance that even the show gives up and just starts dubbing public domain hip hop music over everything. And like, I'm sure that what happens here is technically very offensive to a certain group of people, but. Well, that said, I am not one of those people, and I love it very much. It wasn't anything Thai. It was hula. It was clump. It was everywhere. I don't think that the girl's dance teacher feels the same way about it that I do, though. Veranda is good in entertaining, but she needs to be more disciplined and she should pay attention more in the techniques and the knowledge. That lady is clearly doing her best to be as polite as she possibly can there, but you can see it in her eye that she regrets the day that she ever let top model within a hundred feet of the art form that she loves. In Feranda's defense, I don't think that she meant to be disrespectful. Like, for one thing, I know I'm harping on it a lot, but I really do think that that whole four hours of sleep a night thing she mentioned a few scenes back does go a long way towards explaining why her dance moves look like a sleep-deprived person deliriously flailing around on stage. More than that though, Feranda is clearly a very intelligent person, so I think she could probably see that her time in the competition was coming to an end, and so rather than straining her tired brain trying to remember a dance she was just going to forget in a couple of days anyway, I feel like this was kind of her just saying like, fuck it, I might as well give him a show. And if that's the case, then it totally worked. If it were up to me, Feranda would be declared the winner based on entertainment value alone, but Unfortunately, I wasn't a reality show judge in 2006 because my stupid parents wanted me to have a normal childhood, so instead the prize goes to Joni. And honestly, I'm pretty okay with seeing Joni take the win here. 
Her weird brand of mid-2000s hypersensitive white liberalism meant that she was very clearly paying attention to the lesson because I do kind of get the vibe that in her mind, fucking up a hand gesture would be tantamount to spitting on the grave of every Thai person's ancestors ever. And so because of that, she is very clearly the best at the challenge. More importantly though, her win gives us what is without question the most uncomfortable moment of the week. And like, keep in mind that this episode contains multiple scenes of someone suffering from extreme dehydration. As part of her win, Joni gets to pick a fellow contestant to join in on her prize with her. And so then this happens. Joni, please pick a friend to share your prize. Sarah's never won anything, so. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. appreciate it. I'm happy that she chooses me, but if you're gonna choose me, choose me because you want me to go, not because you feel sorry for me. All right, the 201 level of my acting class will be entirely dedicated to Sarah's smile just now. What makes this whole instance even better is that part of Joni's prize is a dinner, and like, I don't think that Sarah was ever going to be a great dinner date because, well, she's Sarah, but after having been publicly backhanded like that, I feel like this meal has absolutely no hope of being anything other than painful. We don't really end up seeing a lot of it, and I have to imagine that that's because it was just a lot of glaring at one another, awkward silences, and more than a few of these. Aside from her uncomfortable night with Sarah, the other part of Joni's prize is like, like a head. It's like, it's like a really pretty head. I'd like to give you something first as we're dancing so well, very traditional Thai. Oh, thank you, <laughs> it's beautiful. And don't get me wrong, it's a great head, but like, Jade won a diamond ring a couple of episodes back, so if I was Joni, I'd be a little bit... Well, I don't know if disappointed is the right word, but certainly perplexed. Maybe it's just because I live in a city where space is at a premium, but if someone were to gift me a sizable head in a glass box, my thoughts would be, one, how in God's name am I gonna get this home from Thailand, and two, where the fuck am I gonna put it? Thankfully for her though, Joni really seems to enjoy her head as it gives her an opportunity to once again bring up her ongoing feud with Jade. I am going to put my warrior head on the coffee table because that way I'm gonna be staring back at Jade and she will know that there is a warrior looking at her all the time. And that is me. And my first thought upon watching that was like, Okay, Joni, get over it, because while I'm sure that she has every right to be annoyed with her fellow contestant, everything that's happening here is so far removed from Jade that bringing her up out of the blue does start to feel a little bit obsessive. That said though, the more I looked at the head, the more I get why it would make Joni think of Jade, because they actually do have very similar energies. If you were to tell me that it was actually a sculpture of Jade's final form, that would make a lot of sense. Up next is the photo shoot, but before we can get to that, we unfortunately have to check back in on Danielle in the hospital because I do feel like it's necessary in order to set the stage. Danielle was allowed to skip the dance challenge on account of the fact that she was probably dying, but after that, it seems as though a producer broke into her hospital room to let her know that if she didn't participate in the photo shoot, there would be a good chance that she might be going home. And because of that, and because she is Danielle, she decides to ignore the doctor's orders by going home and competing in the photo shoot, rather than allowing herself a proper amount of time to heal. I'm thinking about the girls. They're probably dancing right now, and I'm sitting up here with an IV in my arm. I just got dehydrated really bad. The doctors want me to stay in the hospital. I know I probably should stay, but there's no way that I'm missing the competition. And I think that it's very important that you guys keep in mind that this is the situation we're dealing with when I tell you that the photo shoot today involves the girls riding elephants through the jungle and then posing on said elephants. Poor Danielle. Today, you girls are going to do a shoot for Venus Vibrant, so the first powered razor for women. So we're actually gonna shoot 
in the middle of the jungle. So the only way to get to our location is on an elephant. And then we're gonna take these harnesses off the elephant's backs and you girls are gonna be posing with the elephants. Danielle, what is that face about? They're huge. I truly could not think of a worse situation for a sick person to be in than riding through the jungles of Thailand on elephant back. Like I have nearly barfed from the smell of almost every elephant house I have ever set foot in. And I have never gone to one the morning after I had an IV in my arm. Add on top of that the fact that it seems very hot and the fact that the elephants are bouncing around like a dinghy on stormy waters. And it makes sense that Danielle is not very happy right now. And you know, rather than being sensitive to the fact that she probably shouldn't be standing right now, much less trekking through the jungle, Jay instead decides to spend the whole time on the elephants laughing at Danielle for daring to express any amount of discomfort. Now, by the way, when we go through this jungle, it's, they're, they're gonna tilt and heave and hoe. Oh my God, I'm just gonna get a seatbelt on. <laughs> Danielle, it is not that bad. And like, obviously I don't know the full story, but based solely on what they show us, Jay laughing at Danielle might be the most callous thing to happen in a season that has basically been nothing but callous things. Still, callous or not, this is a great, if probably inhumane, photo shoot. Like, even if the photos themselves were absolute dog shit, it would still probably rank among my favorites of the season, just because it gives us the opportunity to watch Jade interact with elephants, which is really fun because... Well, apparently Jade fucking loves elephants. Isn't this cool? Come here, baby. Come here. To be next to a creature that preposterous and that big, it was just like, wow. I said earlier that I don't think that Jade really cares about the meanings of the word she uses, and I hope that I didn't make it sound as though that was a bad thing, because as that clip I just showed you proves, it actually makes for some pretty remarkable sentences. Like, I personally would have never thought to call an elephant preposterous, but now that I've heard Jade do it, I kind of think that it is the only correct description to give such a creature, because... Well, she's right, it is preposterous. Well, why is its nose like that? And in a normal episode, what Jade just said would have easily been the best sentence of the week, but... Like I said, this is a great episode, and so a few minutes later, Jade manages to top herself with what might very well be my favorite quote of the entire season. I'll always remember this, shooting with an elephant that reminds me of an ancient dinosaur, because they are in the dinosaur family. Mwah. I have no notes. Watching Jade say that elephants are in the dinosaur family fills me with the same combination of joy and wonderment that, well, that Jade feels when she learns that she's actually going to get to ride on one of the elephants. So we're actually gonna shoot in the middle of the jungle. So the only way to get to our location is on an elephant. Like truly, if I didn't know the context of that facial expression, I would probably guess that it was being made by a woman who just saw the face of her firstborn child for the first time. L literally nothing in this world makes me happier than seeing how happy elephants make Jade. S screw family and friends. That said though, while it's certainly a plus, Jade's inexplicable love of elephants isn't the only reason that this photo shoot is a standout. I'd say that of all the photo shoots of the season, this is the one with the most good photos per capita. Joni in particular rocks the shit out of it. Her shoots have been getting better and better with each passing episode and I kind of think that this week is her peak because what she does here is really impressive. Oh, work, girl. Okay, now. Well, there you go. Shoot it. Even rest your arm on the elephant. There you go. Chin down. There you go. There you go. All right, Joni, for trying something new. Okay. Her posing here is so good that at one point, I'm pretty sure that she just straight up mind melds with the elephant. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, Joni. She crawls up the real way. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, beautiful. I love that. And like, obviously she's posing for a picture. She's not doing brain surgery, but watching her do that photo shoot, it feels really hard to deny that there are some genuinely impressive skills on display here. Like, I know that a lot of you would probably disagree with me when I say that Top Model is in any way a talent show, but Joni thinking quickly enough to adapt to the elephant's movements while also considering the angles of her body does to me feel like a genuine talent that not a lot of people have. I guess I can't speak for everyone, but I know that if I personally were on the back of an elephant for the first time and it offered me its trunk, I would not think to elegantly put my fingertips to it as though I was recreating the creation of Adam. I'd probably freak out and fall off and die a very painful death. Thankfully, Joni doesn't do that though. In fact, she does so well in her shoot that Sarah decides to copy a lot of her moves and she does so so blatantly that even Jay and the editors start to shit on her for it. Joni rocked it out and she was so creative. Going after her motivated me to try and match that sort of energy. I wanted to start doing a little bit of the thing that Joni just did. She's gonna start off trying to do the, the same foot thing that Joni did, so she's basically biting her idea. Sarah saw what Joni did. Sarah, obviously being a very intelligent girl, saw my reaction to Joni. Chin down a bit, there you go. But Sarah didn't really execute it in nearly the same graceful fashion that Joni did. And like, I know that I make a lot of fun of Sarah, but watching the show do it, well, it actually makes my job a lot easier. As always, I wanted to do my best to recreate the photo this week, although that proved quite difficult because I don't have access to an elephant because the zoo does not have a sense of humor. Thankfully though, I do have access to another fat smelly creature with weird appendages, my six-toed cat Doodle, so I decided to pose with him instead. He, he wasn't really a fan of that. Fun fact, because the photo shoot was intended to be an ad for leg razors, I actually decided to shave my legs for my photo. So, um, yeah, now my legs are very noticeably shaved. Well, hopefully it doesn't become shorts weather anytime soon. It, it feels very weird when the wind blows. After the photo shoot, it's time for judges panel, which entails one of my favorite judging challenges of all time. This week, you learned how it's important as a model to express yourself through your body. For your judging test, I'd like you to express three emotions using only your body. You look in the box there. You see why you can't use your face? <laughs> So put that on. The girls are basically just tasked with expressing emotions through body language, but the lifeless eyes of the mask they wear, coupled with the fact that it doesn't seem as though the people writing this knew what emotions are, makes for some very memeable moments. Alrighty, the first emotion, sensuality. Okay, what I like about the last part of that clip I just showed you is that Joni very rightfully thought that she was supposed to incorporate the lesson they learned this week into the challenge, and so she just kind of starts doing Thai classical dance, and rather than being like, awesome job using what we taught you, the judges are kind of just like, what the fuck was that? I, I, I have no idea what that means. Still, my favorite moment of the challenge comes from Feranda. She goes first, and because of that, she doesn't realize that Tyra is gonna give her specific emotions to act out, and so this happens. Feranda, I want you to convey three emotions using your body. The first emotion. Oh wait, no, I didn't give it to you yet. Oh. <laughs> and what I love most about that is at that moment, in her mind, Feranda had free range to express literally any emotion on the planet, and I still, for the life of me, could not tell you what exactly she was going for there. Like, 
Is being an archer an emotion? I mean, I guess it's as much of an emotion as sensuality is. So. But yeah, that really made me giggle, and it's things like that that are really going to make me miss Feranda, because like I said, she gets eliminated this week. And while I do agree that it was probably her time, I don't really think that she got the boot for anything that she did so much as she just made it to a point where everyone else was a little bit stronger than her. Still, because it's top model, I do feel like they were trying their best to force a narrative onto her elimination, and like I said earlier, I think it had to do with her complaining about not sleeping enough in the backseat of that van. By complaining, even about something legitimate, and even for just a second, Feranda essentially signed her own death warrant, because if the show is to be believed, being a model is about being strong, and being strong is about tolerating whatever shit gets thrown your way without so much as a peep. And like, maybe I'm just reading too much into it because they really don't talk about Feranda complaining outside of that one instance, but even if that isn't the narrative they're putting on Feranda, it's absolutely the narrative they're putting on the episode as a whole. Without question, the protagonist of this episode is Danielle. This is her story right from this weirdly pertinent quote she says at the beginning of the episode. My favorite quote that I live by is, what we do does not define us, what defines us is how well we rise after falling. Just a little side note on that quote, Danielle is very religious, so I kind of just assumed that it was a Bible verse, but when I started writing this video, I looked it up to try and find a little more context on it, and as it turns out, it's from the 2002 rom-com Made in Manhattan starring Jennifer Lopez. And like, I always knew I respected Danielle, but I feel like it's a testament to just how much I respect her that she can take something Bob Hoskins said in a shitty romantic comedy and make me think that she's quoting Jesus. Still, regardless of the quote's origins, its meaning is clear, and that's that a person's worth is measured by their ability to overcome adversity, and because of that, it feels very appropriate that this is literally the first piece of dialogue we get this week, because that's basically what this entire episode is about. From there, we kind of just watch as Danielle struggles through what seems like excruciating pain before ultimately playing through said pain and excelling at the challenge at hand. And when you take all that with the opening epithet I just showed you, the message is clear. The fact that Danielle risked her health to continue on in this competition is commendable. And like in a lot of ways it is. I think that the fact that she was able to pull off what she did in this episode is a sign of great perseverance and it speaks to how strong of a person Danielle is. So like, kudos to her. Still, I'm a little bit torn on how to feel here. Watching as the show is the biggest cheerleader for Danielle's perseverance feels weird to me because ultimately I think that the thing she's persevering against is the show itself. This is obviously all just speculation on my part, but I really do feel like Danielle ended up in that hospital as a direct result of the producer's attempts to put the girls through the ringer. Like, I don't think that they purposefully gave her food poisoning or deprived her of water or anything, but I absolutely think that the fact that she got diagnosed with exhaustion in the same episode that one of her fellow contestants complained about not getting enough sleep is not a coincidence. And like, even if I'm wrong and the exhaustion was unrelated to the contestants filming schedule, I still think it's impossible to deny that the show is responsible for the worst part of this whole thing, and that's that Danielle did not get the proper time she needed to recover. She willingly ignored the doctor's orders and left the hospital because she was worried that if she got the rest she needed, she'd be eliminated from the competition. And I can't help but feel like if production had just stepped in and said like, Danielle, it's fine, take a day to recover and the competition will be waiting for you when you get back, this whole situation would not be nearly as problematic as it ultimately ended up being. They didn't do that though. In fact, I think the opposite is probably true. Given how Danielle has been defined by her determination to win the competition by any means necessary, I feel like the producers were all probably hard as a rock when they found out that she was in the hospital, because narratively speaking, 
it really is the perfect climax to her storyline. I would be very surprised if they didn't do everything in their power to make sure that things played out exactly as they did here, because it finally gave Danielle the opportunity to put her determination to the test and prove that she was the winner that they clearly wanted her to be. The whole incident kind of reminds me of another quote I know from a mid-2000s movie. Until a person is faced with death, it is impossible to tell whether they have what it takes to survive. And that quote was, of course, spoken by Jigsaw in the movie Saw 4. And, like, that was a joke, but it honestly wasn't as much of a joke as it should be. There really are a lot of times when watching Top Model does feel a lot like a Saw movie. Both feature elaborate and horrific tests of endurance. Both prominently feature puppet mouthpieces who only exist to give the participants their objective. And looming over both is one singular figure who is either a great genius or a dangerous psychopath. It's hard to tell sometimes. Just like Saw, Top Model really is just a series of elaborate torture scenarios designed to test the worthiness of those who manage to survive. The only major difference is that worthiness in Saw is decided by one's will to live, whereas worthiness in Top Model is decided by how badly somebody wants it. I genuinely believe that if every winner ever were to compete in one super season where all their storylines played out exactly the same as they did on their original cycles, Danielle would be the girl who ultimately came out on top. She is, in my mind, the ultimate top model winner, but I don't think that that's because she's the strongest model they've ever had. Like, hell, I don't even think that she's the strongest model they had this season. At this point in cycle 6, I feel like she and Joni were pretty neck and neck, and if they were going to judge the competition based solely on technical modeling ability, Joni probably would have won. That said though, I think that Danielle secured her crown the moment she ripped that IV out of her arm, because that was the moment she proved that she wanted it more than anyone else, and in the world of top model, wanting it is the only thing that matters. Which is weird, the, the, the more I think about it. Because I've spent what feels like a decade at this point thinking about this season of television, and even though I've heard them talk about wanting it multiple times, and even though I can say without a shadow of a doubt that wanting it is the most important thing in the world of Top Model, I'm still not entirely sure what wanting it actually means. I mean, I guess the simplest answer is that wanting it means wanting to win top model, but unfortunately that answer only raises more questions, because like, what about winning top model are you supposed to want? Is it the money? Is it the title? Is it the opportunity that the producers say the show brings, but it doesn't actually bring? I don't know, it's vague, and honestly I think that that vagueness is by design. I think there's a reason that Tyra and her rogues gallery use the least specific word ever, it, to describe what the most important thing at the center of the competition is, and that's because if they were to actually talk about what it means in more concrete terms, the insane things they were asking the models to do in order to get it would not feel worth it. And like, in the show's defense, though it may have taken the practice to bold new heights, Top Model is not the only place that talks about wanting it in this way. Like, honestly, it happens everywhere you look. I myself have spent many a long night beating myself up over just this thing. I talked before about how I decided a while ago that I wasn't going to limit the focus of what I make here to just Top Model videos, even though I know it means I'm probably shooting myself in the foot a little bit, and that does make me wonder sometimes if that means that I don't want it badly enough. And it's not just the type of content I make, sometimes I'll push back a release date rather than breaking my neck trying to reach a self-imposed deadline, and I'll wonder if that 
means that I don't want it enough. Or maybe I'll see my friends on a night I was scheduled to get some work done, and the fact that I prioritize the social life over this channel will make me wonder if that means I don't want it enough. And hell, sometimes I'll be doing everything I'm goddamn supposed to do, I'll shell myself off from the rest of the world and bury my nose in a laptop, but then my brain will decide that it's not gonna work good that night, and the mere fact that my sheer desire for it doesn't override my faulty brain chemistry will make me sit back and think, huh, I must not want it bad enough. And I'm not gonna lie, it really sucks. It makes me feel lazy or ungrateful or like a fraud because I do truly believe that I do want it, so the fact that I'm not willing to devote every fiber of my being to getting it does make me feel sometimes like maybe I shouldn't even bother pursuing it to begin with because it is clearly not something I deserve. I have beaten myself into a funk over this shit many times over the past few years and I will probably do it many more times in the years to come. And honestly, the only way I'm ever able to get past this sort of thing is to do my best to very calmly and coolly ask myself what it even is because honestly usually I don't have a goddamn clue I mean don't get me wrong I do have some ideas sometimes it's stability sometimes it's more money sometimes it's a desire to prove my worth a lot of the time it's some weird combination of those three mixed with a bunch of other shit and a healthy dose of mental illness but most of the time, it's nothing anywhere near as specific as any of that. More than anything, it just exists as this faceless, shapeless dread that simultaneously looms over my head and festers in the pit of my stomach, whose only purpose is to taunt me and make me feel bad about myself until I finally manage to catch whatever the hell it is. The more I think about it, the more I think that wanting it doesn't actually mean wanting anything. I think what the phrase actually means is are you willing to sacrifice your present for the sake of a better future? And if that is actually the case, then it makes me think that what it actually is, is a load of bullshit. I'm old enough now where I've had multiple its in my life. Some of them I've given up on, some I'm still chasing, and some I've actually reached against all odds, and I can tell you that every single path leads to the same place, and that's just more it. I honestly feel like Danielle is a really good example of what I'm talking about, because we can see that she clearly knows what she wants, she goes after it with everything she has, and she ultimately gets it. And like, maybe I'm wrong because the cameras stop rolling at that point, but I feel like once she gets it, that's not the end for her. This is all just speculation, but I feel pretty confident in saying that ANTM did not solve all of her problems because, well, solving problems isn't really ANTM style. If top model is any indication, people will torture themselves in the name of wanting it bad enough. But weirdly, I think the reason that a lot of people do that is because there's something weirdly easier about that than the alternative. Buried within the promise of it is the idea that ultimately you only have one problem to worry about. And so I get why so many people would want that so badly. The idea that if you sacrifice and suffer now, eventually some deus it machina is going to come around and fix all of your problems in one fell swoop is a lot easier to stomach than the idea that you have a lot of little things that you need to start working on now because you're ultimately the only one who can do anything about them. It can't really do shit. I don't think that Danielle was wrong for leaving that hospital room, just as I don't think she would have been wrong for staying, and I don't think that Veranda was wrong for wanting a little more sleep. I think you gotta make whatever choice is right for you in the moment. I just think that unless it's a matter of absolute survival, that choice shouldn't always have to be dictated by where it might one day lead. And because of that, as much as it kills me to defend myself, I don't think I should beat myself up over not making more of these videos. I mean, I probably will, but I don't think that I should. I feel like a lot of you who really like this series are probably going to be a little bit unsatisfied by my excuse that I just don't want to make more top model videos, but... 
The truth is that if I don't want to do it now, I'm not going to want it in the future. And if that means that maybe I don't want it enough, then maybe that's okay, because maybe it's not everything it's cracked up to be. For as nice as it is to think that the future is some magical place where everything's going to be better, really all it is is just the present that hasn't happened yet. And while it sucks to think that your life doesn't have some long, grueling quick fix, maybe you can take solace in the idea that it also means that you don't have to wait until the future comes for things to be better. As much as it pains me to disagree with Tyra, I really don't think that wanting it is the only thing that matters. Honestly, I think the best thing you can do for yourself sometimes is to say fuck it and just do you. But yeah, that's my video. Hopefully it made sense. Um, I feel like I was saying it an awful lot towards the end there, which is never a sign of good writing, but... Um, Whatever, what's done is done. Please like and subscribe and share and comment and I don't know, whatever the fuck else you're supposed to do. Notification bell, I think. Doesn't really matter. YouTube hates me one way or the other. It's not going to show you my videos unless you look for them. Also, please subscribe to my Patreon. That is the most helpful thing that anyone can do for my channel. It really helps me to justify keeping these things up um and i really appreciate it which honestly i do really appreciate it i feel like i don't say it enough but the idea that people are out there who are strangers and are giving me money in order to like do these things it boggles my mind and like i feel like i don't say that enough because it really is insane so thank you to all of my patrons and if you want to be one of them there's a link below. But yeah, other than that, I don't have anything else to say, so goodbye. God, I hope that this video makes sense. Welcome back, true fans, and welcome to everyone's favorite segment of my videos. Willie rambles while he poses for thumbnails and Patreon name scroll. We really should come up with a name for it. Um, but for this one, uh, I feel like usually the top model videos, the, the big seller is the just sort of outlandishness of it. So I feel like what I need to do, I think I'm going to say like, it's obviously good. The title is going to be something about Danielle. And I think the, um, words I'm going to put on the bottom are going to be like, she could have died. Even though I don't know if she was actually that sick, but I'm going to say it because it's YouTube and that's how you get people to come watch you. So I think I just need to react as though like, oh my God, someone could have died. So I also really want to incorporate the knitting because I don't, I don't use it that much, but it's like a knitting show, I guess, kind of. A knitting show. I said that like there's such a thing as a knitting show. Um, well, I guess there is, and it's this, but, um, so I feel like I should be like, so like, just like shocked and like, it actually kind of looks like I'm strangling myself. Um, maybe if I bite down on it. That was gross. Maybe the knitting is not the way to go on this one. Maybe I could just do my old standby of like <gasps> the old YouTubers go to of just shock. Oh my God. Why, why is she not leave? Why is she leaving the hospital? Oh, maybe like that. Maybe like gripping my hands, but I should. Uh... Um. Hmm. What else happens in it? Okay, so. She's dying, 
of exhaustion and I'm scared. Like, yeah! Or like, yeah, I don't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. Like, whoa. Why did I just start doing the robot? What if this ends up being the thumbnail? I'm just like, whoa. I've gotten into a very bad habit where I start recording very late in the day. So um, I feel like this section has gotten progressively less coherent with each passing video. Oh my god. I like I like hands. Well, it's weird because I like hands over face because I like obviously this is not the money maker right here, but um I also feel like it hides sort of the emotion that I'm trying to convey, so like hmm. Oh, maybe that's good. Like what? I should just, like I should, I should just be yelling at my television screen. What the fuck is wrong with you Tyra I don't fucking know man I'm just gonna go to bed now thank you to my patrons ah. I think one of these is gonna work why am I still recording? I already said I'm done. I'm just, fuck it. Just good night.